Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker here this evening in our midst, an old friend of the museum and a personal friend as well, Mr. Umang Hati Singh. Umang, Umang, thank you so much for so spontaneously agreeing to give us this lecture. I know that you have been in Ahmedabad, in Abu, back again in Ahmedabad and facing a lot of uh, webinar difficulties, but uh, thank God all that is behind us now and you have good connectivity from where you're joining us today. Thank you so much. It's a long awaited lecture and we're delighted on behalf of the chairman, CSMBS, the trustees and the director general, Mr. Sabiasachi Mukherjee, my own committee at the Museum Society, members of the Museum Society and friends of the Museum Society who have joined us today who are so readily, happily and joyfully agreeing to address us today on a topic that I know is very dear to your heart, textile heritage of India. Indeed, every Indian, man or woman, young or old, has a passion for textiles. If it wasn't for the Indian community at large, where would all this yardage go? We really know what to make of, whether it's a simple cotton, linen, jute, brocade, zardozi. So we're really looking forward to this lecture. And uh, I know you bring to it all the passion that you have on this subject to this evening's event. Just a few words about our speaker for today. Umang Hati Singh lives in Ahmedabad. He graduated in business science from Babson, University, Babson College in the US, where he was awarded for leadership and humanities for his exemplary qualities as well as for his contribution to the student body at Babson. He further acquired a banking diploma in Japan, and he'll probably tell you what took, you to, what took him to Japan, and J the Japanese link to Indian textiles, especially the contemporary one. He's on the governing body of the Ahmedabad Educational Society, which has a legacy of 78 years and is the educational hub of Ahmedabad. It is currently managing 25 educational and research institutes running under its banner and comprises of approximately 45,000 students. It offers exemplary tutelage in fields as diverse as art, commerce, science, pharmacy, architecture and planning, and business administration, computer application, management, and several other disciplines. Umang is also the managing trustee of the Hathi Singh Visual Arts Center, which is a sister organization to Rabindranath Tagore Shanti Niketan. Realizing that academics alone do not shape society, the Hathi Singh Visual Arts Center was established to encourage and promote various artists in the fields of the visual art, theater, dance, music, sculpture, photography, media, and television. To this day, the center has conducted over 2000 contemporary activities over the last four decades. Omang has been invited to various prestigious educational institutions and museums to deliver and share his experience and expertise with the modern generation. And he keeps on emphasizing this during every discussion that we have. We want our youth, not only our youth, but the youth all over the world to get fascinated, grab their attention, and tell them about what India and Indian textiles is all about. It has to become a generational thing, and Umang is well on his way to establishing that. He has spoken at several prestigious institutes, as I said, starting, of course, in his hometown, the National Institute of Fashion Technology at Gandhi Nagar in Gujarat. He's spoken to the World Craft Council, He's spoken to the Oman India Joint Business Council and several other institutes. Umang, thank you so very, very much for taking the time out. And uh, we're looking forward to your lecture this evening. And I would end by saying thank you to our technical team. This age of Zoom has really changed the way we conduct business at the museum and at the Museum Society. So a big round of applause from me personally to our technical team, Jason, Rinalini, Sanjana, and Yashraj, and Umang's technical team of Vinita and Divya. 
for being with us this evening for a smooth functioning of what is going to be an exciting journey over the next hour or so. So thank you very much, Tech Team. I hand you over to Mr. Umang and to share his screen and let's get on with the show. Thank you. Good evening. And you no, know, I would like to thank the Museum Society and all the trustees and of course, my dear friend Firoza and many other friends of the Museum Society, personal and you know, social. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm delighted and honored to share a perspective of Indian textile history and heritage. And starting from why are we India to what is modern fashion today? And the, what, you know, when 65% of, of India is below 30, uh, so the statistics say, how do we excite and involve them into what might be considered a dead and fossil museum academic work? Well, there are, we have to find what excites them. And so this presentation is really made to uh, sort of in a non-conventional format to bring a bit of excitement into the youth and the museum society. I hope you will enjoy it and um, you know, pardon me for taking certain liberties in my presentation of making it contemporary and youthful. Honored to be here with, with the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sanghalai and the Museum Society of Mumbai. We start our journey from Indus Valley civilization, you know, and textile heritage of India, royal patronage to contemporary fashion. And here we are seeing a beautiful Angarka from the Metropolitan Museum, you know, from the Mughal period. And, you know, I'm very happy to know that even today's modern young men are, are willing and enjoying to wear the Angarka. Uh, it's uh, I started with the royal pit in the Mughal era. No. The history of India may well be written with textile as its leading motive. Is a very, very, very recognized and famous statement made by Jawaharlal Nehru when we got independence. And this is the story of that history of text India through its textiles. Cotton and indigo. You know, to the old, you know, people think that Egypt gave, gave cotton to the world, but that is not true. The two of the oldest cotton plants, Cupusium albertum and Cupusium herbicus, originated in India. And indigo, as the name suggests, originated in the Indus Valley and was the first resist dye known to civilization. The dye became the art of decorating fabric and the father of ink. Existence of cotton, the proof of existence of the cotton in the subcontinent dates back as far as 1750 BC and is provided by canvas fragments found in one of the most important sites of the Indus Valley civilization, Mohenjo-daro. And here you see the Mohenjo-daro most famous sculpture of the priest wearing a beautifully decorated fabric around his shoulder. You know? And uh, we uh, know that this was a very, uh, Important. Rig Veda, you know, is one of the most ancient texts of India. And the Rig Veda has very, very clearly written uh, in detail, not only of the very highly developed uh, art of weaving in this period, we find detailed reference of weavers who have also woven cotton, wool, hemp, and even shining gold and silver brocades. So we realize that it is far ancient art than we, we credit ourselves for. And it continues even till today. The making of cloth is one of the earliest known industrial industries and among the industrial arts of India, cotton weaving is the oldest, the most important. Cotton products were exported from India millenniums before the birth of Christ. And you see this wonderful you know, image of traditional women drying their cotton, you know, and uh, it's just luxurious. So luxurious were the Indian cottons and the muslins that they became famously known across the world as woven air, running water, and evening dew. 
and you see the beautiful sculpture of Buddha in the Gandhara style. And if you look at his drape, you can, you can see the flows of the water and the air being woven into it. These were the beauty of Indian Muslims. That in Egypt, the full star textiles and block textile excavated in the tomb of Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II have been identified of Indian origin. Almost identical designs, in the same colors, are still being produced in Anjar after two millennium. These are the beautiful Ajraks. And, you know, to find a textile tradition and design that have survived 2,000 years is a particularly beautiful thing. And in India, this tradition lives on in its full magnificence. And, you know, we have to, so you see how the use of indigo and cotton appear in them. Yeah, and Greece, you know, during the time of Alexander the Great, Herodotus who was a historian in, in, in the uh, services of the great uh, conqueror, has very well written that when the Greeks came to India, in Alexander, they speak of a kind of tree wool, exceeding in beauty and excellence to that of sheep, as being made into beautiful garments by Indians, far exceeding those in Greece. And that is the beauty of, you know, recorded by Alexander's historians. China, the mention of silk and silkworms is found in ancient Indian epics. Even though silk was developed in China, it is possible that it was introduced into India long before the days of the epics. And we find that certain kinds of silk and silkworms found in the Eastern and Central parts of India are also quite unique and very ancient. And here you had a Chinese emperor wearing silk and, and silk embroideries. And these then later evolved and be, became the silk became part of weaving patolas and the silk embroideries became a very important part of the Parsi community and wearing garas. And these still exist here in India today, even though it has gone out of fashion from Chinese outfits. Sorry, I'll go back. Rome. Now, Italy is a center for fashion, and everybody wants to go to, to Milan and Italy and, and you know, buy fabulous new contemporary. But let it be known that during the time of Emperor Caesar, the demand for Indian textiles was so high that he had to tax the Indian textiles heavily and had them restricted to the highest nobility. You know, they carried an extensive trade with Indian textiles, but you know, it was so large that Pirini II, who is an historian of in during the time of Alexander and of the time of uh, Augustus Caesar, has recorded that a large number of gold coins were left to Roman treasury and landed in the port of Surat and Cochin just to pick up Indian textiles. And the drainage of the Roman economy was so high that the Caesar had to ban them at times. So uh, there was a time when India ruled Italian fashion and not the other way around. The East, the Arab traders came here and they took the Indian fabrics to the East where they found great demand and royal patronage. In fact, the Gujarati Patola you know, was so popular that in Indonesia, the royal, several royal and noble families wore it. And here you have this side where they're wearing Indian brocade and you see the, the canopy across on their head is of a Patola. And that showed the status and position of the royal families then, you know. So, and the Patola became a great source of inspiration and influence for fabrics from Cambodia and Vietnam to Indonesia and all across the South China Sea. France, you know, we all go to Paris and we love Paris Fashion Week and the Parisian style. But when the European traders took luxuries of Indian textile to the West, fabrics like muslin, calico, chins, chamrosery, palanpore, and pashmina had great demand in the European markets especially amongst the highest aristocracy. Uh, it was in the fair of Saint-Germain in 1685, the toil imprint, the art of painted and printed cottons from India appeared for the first time in France. And this started a caprice that was ruled French fashion for almost 80 years. You know, there was a great demand in France for the Indian fabric. And it can, it is a very long period in any French, and 
you know, here we have a portrait of Emperor Napoleon's wife, Josephine, you know, Empress Josephine, wearing a dress made of pashmina. And this is a portrait hanging in the loop because it showed that she was uh, as rich and popular and, uh, and aware of fashion to import such luxurious fabrics, which only the empress would wear. You know, another very small, interesting part of history in India is that in 1620, there was a young princess who was abducted. Her name was Meera. And she was abducted from the port, uh, from Surat on the beach by the uh, uh, European traders, uh, you know, ship uh, people, the Spaniards, and taken to the Philippines. And from there, she landed up in Puebla, which is the center for gold and trade uh, and collection for the, during the uh, Spanish empire. And Meera from India became the Chena Poblana, the lady from the East. And so popular was she, and as a saint and a savior in Mexico, that her clothing, which came from you know, Gujarat, Rajasthan, embroidered skirts and blouses and a dupatta, became the national dress of Mexico, until today is celebrated as Chena Poblana. So India's influence to Mexico and Americas is from 1650 in textiles and costumes. In the Mughal era, you know, exquisite textile art blossomed in India. Safari textiles of woven gardens and Indian artistic sensibilities blended to create magnificent use, you know, ma magnificent, lavish use of gold, silver, and embroidered jewels created some of the most exquisite jewels and costumes ever produced on earth. You know, and here you have the last Emperor Bahadur Shah in his Mughal magnificence. So large was the demand for Indian products. And after when Bahadur Shah was exiled and in East India Company took over and Queen Victoria declared herself Empress of India. 18th century that bled Europe of its resources and imperial uh, objectives wanted to plunder their colonies. Indeed, so great was the popularity that European countries were 18th century to protect local industries both France and England had to adopt penal laws and prevented the entry of Indian textiles. They took our cottons and our raw materials and you know, we were banned from selling it to them directly. This led to Mahatma Gandhi and the independence movement. In the 20th century, Gandhiji had made hand spinning and weaving of cotton yarn and the charkha symbols of Swaraj. Thus Khadi became the warp and weft of India's independence and you know, the European fabric which was dumped into India by taking our raw materials was, you know, was uh, sort of put on hold or uh, discarded by the, by the Indian market. You know, sorry. The Indian handloom industry from that time again started growing. And today, no, Indian textile and handloom industry employ such a large number of people across the country that it is the second largest economic employment sector after agriculture. And it is important that, you know, with the industrial revolution that, you know, uh, new and cheaper fabrics were brought in. We sustained our handloom economy until today, sustain it. And we are one of the few countries in the world where handcrafted textiles are still consumed and beautifully enjoyed. We must continue this patronage. Independent India and textile tradition in contemporary fashion. See, as times change and yet the products remain the same, we have to grow, otherwise like dinosaurs, we will become redundant. And what we have, if there is no market, a product will not survive. So in a modern India with youngsters coming, you know, wanting new things, um, they appreciate the tradition, but want something more fun and, and fashionable. So we had to look at something more different. So, so in, when India turned, you know, uh, was coming of age, the government of India in, 80, uh, in 1987, Zandra uh, Rose at that time was invited to India. You know, she was a very famous designer and uh, started working with Indian artisans and fabrics to create products and markets for the global world. 
and bringing Indian textile into contemporary fashion. In 1997, uh, for 50 years of India's independence, you know, we've already had a generation that has grown of 50 years and a new generation is coming of age. And they all have different aspirations and different design aesthetics. So, you know, Ralph Lauren decided to uh, take an exhibition to the Metropolitan Museum and to the US showing the beauty of Indian craftsmanship. And I worked with that on, with him. And that really started a triggering in America or India's 50th of independence. And then there was the uh, India uh, the, uh, Festival of India's Worldwide it also showcased Indian culture. And it started awakening people in the West and which were the main markets for India's luxurious textiles. Same thing with Asia society and, you know, with, uh, for India's, India's independence, we did a wonderful exhibition there, you know, showcasing Indian uh, textile and Indian art, which started awakening the uh, American and European markets. The British Museum, again, is all in 97, 98. Then in 99, you know, it is interesting because, you know, my perspective is that, you know, we need to, uh, to generate employment and create market for our craftspeople we need to create markets. Yes, there is a traditional Indian market, but as the youngsters in India, 65% will go to 70% in a few years. What do they want? The youngsters around the world are attracted to glamour and fashion. Very few are traditionalists in the, in the pure sense. When they get older, they do realize the value of tradition and embrace it. But that, that is an, a, a process and of metamorphosis, and we must understand and capture their imagination and create a market so that our craftspeople can, and our youth can find a collaborative medium. So I worked with Vogue in 99 and world's top designers to create a story called All the Raj. And because in 99, the image of India was either they were snake charmers or sadhus or, or, or taxi drivers in New York. And we had to change that image. And so this was created. And here we work with various top designers. And I must share with you what the story is, because here it is, you know, one of the India's top, uh, America's top model, Maggie Rizvi, and Rahul Khanna was a VJ in America with MTV and a known face, so we had two of them. And the story that everything has, you know, all fairy tales begin once there was a prince and once there was a princess. And so this is a fairy tale of a prince and a princess falling in love. And here you have an inspiration of a Western dress inspired from a Shenwani. You know, the sleeves are removed and cut. And it's, it's a... and then here you have Rahul Khanna and Maggie Rizvi, you know, footprints on, you know, on a new horizon, fresh footprints. And here Rahul, Rahul is wearing a traditional simple, he's a prince who has come from uh, his homeland to find, become a Bollywood star, a modern day Maharaja. And she's come from America with a dollar and a dream. And she's wearing a Vanjara skirt. The Vanjaras would sell these skirts, you know, on the beaches in Goa and Maharashtra. But except it's not a Vanjara skirt. It's made by Yamamoto, a great designer inspired by the Vanjara skirts. Cheruti. And here, you know, uh, she's wearing khaki and, you know, the school children in khaki, India gave khaki to the world. And here you have school children wearing their khaki uniforms. And this is the time of Princess Diana and how she, you know, he's giving it just a little kid. She's also wearing khaki uh, with katori work. You know, this is done in Kutch, and but it is a Cheruti dress and uh, how Indian textiles and Indian craftsmanship is used by world design houses. Max Maran, again, you have another top, then you have a pin tux shirt and uh, Abra work with Ari work, you know, uh, skirt, you know, again, inspired by the Women of Kutch made into a contemporary dress by Max Mara. And yeah, you know, it's a very interesting slide. In the, I'm, I, mean, I was a creative producer for this shoot and we had 22 pages in American work, work working with Anna Wintour and uh, the top American team, just fantastic. You know, I learned a lot and, and I taught them a lot also. And here you have you know, Maggie Dewsby going in a hand rickshaw and that was a time when Coca-Cola and Pepsi are coming into the Indian market. We are getting, you know, more commercial. Till then, we had our, our thumbs up. 
And look at the rickshaw print and the John Galliano shirt. You know, there's a dialogue there. And the encrustment of the rickshaw seat and the Fendi trousers. So why, you know, if the world's designers can take inspiration from our rickshaw, well, why can't we? You know, the youngsters, we have so many design institutions. I would encourage them to look at everyday life and find inspiration and create magic. Yeah. And then here we have a Chanel dress. You know? So here we are taking the story that you know, the young prince takes his uh, girlfriend back to his old kingdom and, you know, uh, integrates and, and you no, know, here she's wearing a Chanel dress, but Rajputs also wear pink, men wear pink. And, you know, India gave polo to the world and yeah, it's a polo, you know, large floor anything, but we are the only country that played elephant polo. And after this shoot, today it's a tourist attraction in seven countries, but, and the polo and Indian attire has becoming breeches and jacket, bandhikalas have become very popular again. Look at the amber elephants painted in Jaipur, you know, pink, yellow, blue, you know, and the structure. And you have Maggie in this outfit, which is made by Tom Ford for Gucci. But you know where the inspirations come from and how you know, these things are made into um, popular garments by uh, even Gucci. And it's a Jill Sander outfit. And you, you, know, uh, you see the Sherwanis and the Chogas that the men are wearing. And she's wearing the same cut, except the sleeves are removed and little change. How beautiful and elegant it is. And, um, this is uh, part of the Vogue story and many of the top world designers working with Indian fabrics and Indian designs. Yeah, you see a sari made by John Galliano and embroidery is taken from the encrusted doors of the Jaipur Palace. And both of them have tassels hanging in the front, uh, which symbolizes how, you know, Indian costume and sari in, you know, bringing in the drape and the silhouette. Um, but also showcasing, you know, classical India in the contemporary world. Finally, you know, yeah, they, they, they get married and you have this picture and she is, you know, this is done in 99. I shot this in 99, styled it. And she's wearing a skirt and a blouse, you know, and no Odina, you know, because it was for a uh, young, and even today, you know, the Odina is, the younger girls are not, not want to wear an Odina, they're wearing, uh, skirts and a fa fancy top as a new um, new outfit and the, the evolution of the classical lenga. This was done 20 years ago and it, would do, it was fun, wonderful because throughout the, the winter and uh, season of 99, this became the style statement in New York. And uh, for the opera and the Lincoln Center, you saw wonderful women wearing lengas and blouses, you know. Then in, uh, Paris, you know, we've always again, you know, uh, it was in 2010 and we, it was exactly 100 years from the Delhi Darbar from 1911. And Paris is a very important city where fashion and art is concerned. Now we have to, you know, the idea is fashion starts from top down, not bottom up. And my whole presentation is how do we influence the top to start working and this will trickle down to the grassroots. So in Yves Salona was nominated as the most important fashion icon of the 20th century. And, you know, he started designing in 1950 for Christian Dior. And uh, later on, he became the first designer to put women in trousers and black tie. And he worked very closely to, you know, to put what is the modern ramp, the ramp on the ramp and the, the fashion style as things change forever. And we still continue that style. So in 2010, you know, we said it's a celebrate 100 years. The grandest event of 2010, I mean, of 20th century was the Delhi Darbar in India when King George V and Queen Mary came here and declared themselves as the emperor and empress of India. And all the Maharajas went in their full splendor and, you know, to the, Delhi, to the court of the Delhi Darbar. And then in 1947, we achieved independence and Khadi became a national outfit. But during this period of 1911 to 1947, India 
you know, the, the Maharajas of India were, were the finest couture and the finest jewels and Armez or made the saddles and Louis Vuitton made their bags, you know. So the first part of uh, the set exhibition was at the, in, in a museum, at the YSL Museum, it was supported by Cartier and even various important foundations of France. And so we are, we are showed the Maharajas in the outfit and there's a sari designed by Yves Saint Laurent. He was the first European to design a contemporary sari as a dress. It was a zip up sari and uh, it was a style statement. And he would, then came here and did a fashion show on the Gateway of India in like 1985, you know, um, and uh, uh, it was legendary, but using Indian textiles and fabrics. So this is all the large from 1911 to 1947. And, and 266 items from our collection were taken to France and showcased at the museum for five and a half months. And one month later, 400 pieces of Yves Saint Laurent went to the Petit Palais and together we juxtaposed 100 years of fine couture never before done in the world. And people from across, top designers from across the world attended. I mean, uh, we had three presidents of France attend and uh, the entire uh, world's uh, uh, fashion body come and we had great discussions on why it is important not just to preserve material heritage, but to preserve living heritage, the arts and crafts of India. So this is the exhibition in the uh, uh, magnificence of Indian Royal Delhi Delhi. Wonderfully done. And uh, we presented 266 items, which really opened the eyes of European and Western designers that what is Indian, uh, from a color palette to the grammar of Indian design, to the aesthetics of our you know, rich heritage in various textile formats. And in five and a half months, I'm proud to say that we had I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of visitors. It was the most successful show and it also opened the year of India in France and Paris Fashion, Paris Fashion Week. So it was, it was wonderful. Yeah, 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 for the next three months, Maharajas will rule Paris. So, you know, it's not that this Louis Vuitton can come and rule India, we can also go and rule Paris in fashion and luxury. Now, Wake up, youngsters, it's your age to do it. The impact, influence, inspiration on global designers because of what we know India is coming and doing. In, so this is where we go. Yeah. And after the Paris show, I mean, Christian Lacroix you know, did a similar exhibit of Syrian costume Indian influence because it became the my Paris show was so popular that all the designers across the world attended, started something with India. And yeah, Christian Labouton, you know, made in Maharani, Halimiki Maharani shoes. I mean, isn't that fabulous? I mean, think of it, it's taking India to the world and the image of India as just snake charmers or sadhus or, or uh, Maharajas or old world uh, taxi drivers is changing. And we are making not just techies and high corporate people, but the soft power of India also is moving forward with its yoga and Indian textile heritage. So this is important because people across the world know Labutong, the youngsters, and they want to wear his shoes. And here you have Indian inspired shoes by Christian Labutong. And you have Kanali making the bandhkana, Nawab jacket, the bandhkana. So, you know, from a double breast or you know, single breast suit, now even Kanali makes bandhkanas. Now, I think it's a very proud moment for India to say, yes, you know, we are not, a, a, you know, just a subcontinent lost, you know, uh, in the fashion world. We are very mainstream and, and powerful with our own style and statement. Armes, again, a very, very luxurious firm. You know, all of the younger designers are striving to create and uh, Western outfits or, you know, what the food. But the European countries, realizing the potential of Indian purchasing power and Indian heritage, are creating Indian outfits. And Armes even launched saris in India in Mumbai in 1911. And this is Hermes Saris. So I was with the Hermes family and, uh, in Paris and, and in Morocco. And you know, we were in uh, green, purples, and reds. And we, the next season, we had a green, purple, and red sari. And they sent me a shot and said, Umang, you inspire us. And this was very, very funny. But it's uh, Hermes Saris, worn in a very contemporary. Now, if Hermes can make saris, you know, why are we afraid to do this, continue the same traditions? 
Louis Vuitton, the world's largest design company or a luxury company, even they in their 454 stores spanning five continents were decorated with columns of trunks made by banana leaves, which, which glowed softly like lanterns, like the Indian, you know, patralas and like, and they were aimed to give passport a feeling of gaiety for Diwali. Why? Because India was a huge market for them then and a huge market for them now. But they also work with Indian sensitivities, you know, and they had asked me to collaborate with them and do shows worldwide with our Royal Costume Collection and Louis Vuitton, but um, I decided to do that with, uh, with uh, YSL instead of uh, for certain personal reasons. And uh, here you have, you know, I worked with this. Mark Jacob recreates the Poshak from Vintage Sari. And, and this is wonderful because it is really using Indian brocade and Indian Sari in a very wonderful new way and imagination and uh, opens new markets for our products and, and for our younger people. So this is Mark Jacobs for Louis Vuitton. And then with Carl Lagerfeld, you know, unfortunately he passed away, but you know, dear friend, you know, he designed for Chanel and Chanel being a very important brand. And after my exhibition, you know, uh, Chanel got Carl to design and launched his new collection called Mumbai Paris in 2012. And this is a collection by Carl Lagerfeld of Mumbai and Paris, taking Indian inspiration and Indian fabrics and creating a new, uh, not a new, a new genre in Indian costumes and Indian heritage. So there is Carl Lagerfeld for Chanel. And the Smithsonian Institute in the US, which is also the Cooper Hewitt uh, Design Museum, International Museum of, uh, in America for its... Uh, you know, so I was working with them just to influence uh, and bring in the position of India as an important design source and uh, you know, uh, production source. So we had a discussion on the Paisley and they said, oh, the Paisley is you know, all European. And I said, no, it's not European. It started with India. And, and uh, so they have, they changed their thing and have, you know, put my fist as the origins of the Paisley, but it started with educating the museums. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was great fun. And then they asked me to do a collection of uh, prints and designs for the museum, which I did. And, uh, with the decorative arts department in the Cooper Hewitt Museum. And you know, it's so many people from, uh, who have no connection to India see this and they, it opens a window to connect them to our country and save with, with the Prince Klaus Fund. Then in you know, 2012, uh, we worked with you know, uh, Vogue again and various designers Vogue in, to create new garments. For eight years, I was in charge put by the government of Gujarat when our prime minister was the chief minister in Gujarat to revive the patola. And at that time, there were very few families making patolas and we sort of made uh, sort of sample looms to give free to people who wanted to learn it and did vocational training. Today, patola is pop very popular and largely food is available every year. There was a period when it was dying in 2012. And we worked with Gucci to create a patola dress. And so this is a Gucci uh, dress uh, for, for a uh, uh, made of patola, and uh, Donna Karen worked with a baluchari sari and from Bengal and made made a baluchari dress outfit with uh, with and uh, Miss Sony worked with chicken curry and you have a chicken curry dress, you know, uh, and I love this. It's, it's a Roberto Cavalli. I mean, this is Bandhani, a Bandhani sari made into a dress by Roberto Cavalli. And you know, wh why I'm showing you all this is that if I, well, don't look at anything in, into the as a design, look at it as, as a support for our craftspeople and our product for them to grow and uh, to establish a strong, soft power across the world of Indian products. And here's you are but using part and mushroom. You now again into a beautiful dress. Yeah, this is Gujarati band. It's unopened bandhani. And you know, very often from uh, various communities, we have bandhani to ordinary and we do not open it, we let it through. So this is actually a bandhani dress made of unopened bandhani. And uh, you know, uh, it's, it's done by Etro. And Etro has always been a great uh, 
has always been inspired by Indian textiles and fabrics, but this is wonderful working with him and on, you know, and creating this Bandhani outfit. And Todd's, you know, with the country where himself made the Todd bags and, you know, very nice, smart. And for the World Craft Council, again, the, and they invite the, and uh, people from various countries to come and give a talk and, and, and uh, you know, it had to be focused on what, what is the future? I mean, how, where are we going with craft? And you know, we said that the future of luxury is handmade. The industrial revolution had brought in many changes and created products that were mass produced and were in great demand after the war till now. But as we grow as a society and find economic wealth, we find that if we lose the beauty of hand craftsmanship, a great heritage would be lost forever. So we got uh, people in countries around the world to say, let's support hand craftsmanship. And that is actually the most luxurious. You know? So this goes into taking it to a higher royal patronage because fashion starts from the top. And uh, that is what we would, here is the Queen of Bhutan. She's also great, and the Queen Mother of Bhutan, she's a great patron of Indian textile and Indian craft because Bhutan and India do share a lot of emotional and border issues uh, of pleasantness. And uh, so, you know, she ordered a large collection from here and the Bhutanese people are very gracious and support uh, Indian textile, I love Indian textile, but this is from Her Majesty. She came to Ahmedabad and I did a presentation for her and she visited my studio and uh, uh, she runs a textile institute in Bhutan and a very important institute, which is probably the best in, in Asia. And then we went, you know, we talk of luxury and, and fine, refined products. I worked with Holland and Holland in 2014. They invited me to do work with them and Holland and Holland were known to create wonderful guns for the Maharajas and the royal families. But they, what people do not know is that Holland Holland is also the official outfitters to the Queen of England and many royal families across Europe. So working with them to create handcrafted collections. Um, and they only have one store in the world on Burton Street and we did a, I did a show there with them. And most of the collections were sold out before uh, launch because uh, I mean, from Barbara Bruce to Madonna, that is the kind of clientele they have and all gone. Uh, it was an eye opener. But with them, we did a show at Buckingham Palace also for, uh, for the Queen's coronation. And we got, it was the first time you know, I worked with, uh, we got Indian motives, you know, uh, from our Banarasi saris and a, a mochi kaam thing, and woven in Como and uh, hand-stitched in Scotland for the royal family. And this is a wonderful dinner jacket for them. But it, what it, this does is that it takes aesthetics of Indian design and encourages youngsters and people design across the world to work with Indian, Indian craftspeople. And so here we are showing Indian craftspeople embroidery and two out, very contemporary outfits, you know, one with mochi embroidery as a waistcoat and one as a jacket for women. Again, these are for Holland and Holland. Uh, you know, so that was in England. Uh, then we can, you know, the Middle East, the Middle East is also a very important market. In the Middle East and India have shared a very important relationship since several centuries. You know, the Indo-Islamic uh, uh, relationship are very deep culturally, right from Iran and Safavid dynasties and Mughal dynasties. So, you know, uh, but the younger generation of people in uh, the Middle East do not come to India. And in fact, the prime minister had invited them specifically because the, young, the older generation, most of the grandfathers and fathers even went to school in India. But the, today's wealthy uh, uh, youngsters of the Middle East go to Europe and America you know, or Singapore, but don't come to India. And so we had to take India to them. And we did this exhibition with the Queen of Bahrain uh, at the Bahrain National Museum. It's, only, you know, uh, uh, it's a fantastic contemporary museum and attracts people from now, across the world, uh, Middle East, and I know this was you know, we, uh, the magnificent Maharajas in Bahrain at the National Museum. And we got, you know, we gave lecture, I gave lectures at the university over there at various universities in the Middle East, talking about Indian heritage and Indian textiles and showing them what can be done. And 
the response was absolutely amazing. And we still get now museum groups and textile people from across the Middle East coming to Ahmedabad to see the Calico Museum and learn from us and go to, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, this is taking a textile heritage uh, right uh, uh, you know, across. You know, so th then there are other museums and I'm talking about museums because what goes to museum has to be of important world heritage and, the, and uh, important to humanity. And, and uh, we worked with the museum, Baroque Museum in Mexico in Puebla. Now the China Poblana, the, uh, the Indian princess Mira who had gone to uh, Mexico, went to Puebla and started the, uh, their national dress. So the Baroque Museum, which is a fantastic new museum designed by Toyo Ito, and it's about Baroque art, you know, uh, contemporary Baroque as well. It opened, and uh, it opened actually with uh, our Indian textile collection designed the Neo Baroque Maharajas. And the president inaugurated, and I was commissioned to make handcrafted costumes um, in Baroque style for them in 2016. And in the opening, the president inaugurated, and in the opening uh, one month, we had more than 100,000 visitors. And the five months that the exhibition was, was there at the museum, we had more than 600,000 visitors. So you know, it really took India and the India story to Latin America and Central America. Uh, it was very, very fascinating. And uh, we get mu now museum groups and student groups from there coming to India to interact with Indian designers and Indian craftspeople. And finally, you know, the Miho Museum in Japan. To please the Japanese is no easy feat. And the Miho Museum in Japan is an exceptional museum um, where it's designed by I.M. Pei in the middle of uh, Three Hills and is, is in the, it's a private museum by, uh, you know, by a wealthy Japanese family. And they invited Sheikh ha Hamad Altani of Qatar to show the fabulous Altani jewels in Qatar. And, to sh show those jewels correctly and in relevance, the Miho Museum had commissioned me to create one Islamic set and one Hindu set of uh, costumes and set that would enhance the Mughal, original Mughal jewelry of Akbar Jahangir and the Nizam, right, also of various Indian Maharajas. And uh, you know, this is Sheikh Hamad and the Maharani of Wali and the Maharani of Baroda and uh, are working together for the Miho Museum. And, this is what we created, you know, the beautiful you know, Murshidabad Khadi, not Khadi, Malmal muslin, and uh, embroidered in fine metallic thread. And you know, here you see that in the beautiful style with the original uh, Altani collection of jewels. This was done by me in 2016. And it is permanently housed, bought by the Miho Museum now. And Japanese people are again discovering the beauty of Indian Malmal. I mean, there are few top people in you, but again, it became so popular and we are creating new markets for our craftspeople through that. Yeah. So going from embroidered uh, and luxury to, to back to Malmal and to Indigo. So it was in 2019, understanding that Indigo and cotton are the identity of Indian origins of textile heritage. And uh, uh, Arvind Mills opened at the Kasturi Lalbay Museum, a, a collection of indigo, uh, the indigo initiation of Indigo Museum. And uh, cotton and indigo still dominate the world of fashion today. I mean, if you see any youngsters in any around across the world, I would say majority of them, doesn't matter what language, what school, what profession, what color, and what gender, they all wear denim and they all wear white and, and all wear cotton t-shirts. And that is the most important generic statement. And India has both of them, and we should capitalize on this and take it to the world. You know, this is in 2019. And here you have Prince Harry and Meghna in indigo and cotton, and you have Celina Gomez in her indigo and cotton, a royal patronage and contemporary fashion going back to Indus Valley you know, of indigo and cotton. That's 4,700 years of Indian history through its textiles, you know, of what we daily wear, but do not recognize. And of course, from ancient times to modern day, 
India's luxurious textile heritage still continues to fascinate the world. And my humble tribute to many unknown artisans and craftspeople of India from whom we have inherited such an important and beautiful legacy, history and traditions. First, the first, the best and the most perfect of all instruments is still the human hand. Thank you for your patience and for joining me.